hi guys now we're ready for chapter eight so let's see what happens it wasn't long after breakfast the next morning when there was a loud knock on the front door I went to answer it. There was a tall man standing there with a kind of a small suitcase. He looked sort of annoyed. Dr. Zemer in? No, I said. He doesn't live here. Well, where does he live? This is Walter Twitchell's house, isn't it? Yes, but Dr. Zimmer doesn't live here. He's staying at the McPherson's. McPherson's? Where the devil is that? I pointed down the street to the right. You go down that road about a half a mile until you come to the Forks. Take the right-hand road there. I mean, the one that goes sharp right. The middle road takes you to Keyser Falls. Then follow the road for, well, four ways. And pretty soon you'll come to a sharp curve where there's a barway and a stone wall. But the bars are all down because they don't keep cows in there anymore. Oh, they don't, eh, the tall man said. Isn't that fascinating now? I thought he sounded kind of impatient. No, not anymore, I said. It's all growing up to pine and blackberry bushes now. But anyway, just beyond that curb, there's a road off to the side with a sign on a tree that says Saunders, but you can't read it very well because the Saunders paints all faded. Mr. Saunders used to own that land down there, but he sold it to the summer people two or three years ago. And a little ways along that road, you'll come to another road that, for John's sake, the man spluttered, this road and that road and signs I can't read and cows that aren't there. You've got me all mixed up. If I went down there in that wilderness, I'd be so lost that even the FBI couldn't find me. I'll just bet this is some stupid trick of Zemer's. I suspected something right from the start. If he doesn't live here, why did he tell me to come to this house? Then it dawned on me. You wouldn't be Dr. Kennedy, I asked him. Sure, I'm Kennedy. And a first class fool, too, for listening to that practical joker. But he wasn't joking, I said. We really do have a dinosaur. It just hatched out yesterday morning. How do you know it's a dinosaur? Who told you? Dr. Zemer did. Dr. Kennedy scowled, just as I thought, he said. What the matter up here in New Hampshire? What's the matter up here in New Hampshire? Don't people know that dinosaurs died about 60 million years ago? He put his suitcase down on the porch floor. We don't, well, don't just stand there. Show me this animal of yours, whatever it is. I might as well look at it after coming all this way. We had just started down the porch steps when a car stopped in front of the house. Dr. Zemer got out. When he saw Dr. Kennedy, he smiled and waved his hands. Hello, Kennedy. You made good time. How'd you get here so soon? So soon? Good grief. I've been traveling all over New England trying to get to this place. I took a plane to Portsmouth and a train from there to some place in the middle of nowhere. Then I got a ride on a bre bread truck to s some other abandoned place and walked from there to here. And by golly, Zemer, if this is another of your professional jokes, I swear I'll skin you and stuff you and put you in the museum on exhibit as a degenerate ape. All right, old man, just cool down, Dr. Zemer said. Just let us show you the dinosaur. Then you'll be convinced. And after that, you can have some breakfast and you'll feel better. I led the way out of the chicken yard and into Uncle Beasley's pen. The chickens were scratching around nearby and they cocked their heads at us. There, Dr. Zemer said. Now, maybe you'll believe me. Just bend down and look into the box there and see for yourself. Probably the only living dinosaur ever seen by a man. One of the most remarkable happenings known to science. Dr. Kennedy gave me his kind of dubious look, and then he bent way over. He was awfully tall, and he had a hard time getting his head down that far. He looked into the box. Dr. Zemer waited for a, long, for a while for the sight to sink in, and then he said, Well? Well, what? Dr. Kennedy said. I don't see anything in here, just an empty box. What? We both said at once. We got down and looked. Sure enough, it was empty. Good heavens, the doctor said. He's gotten out. Quick, we've got to find him. He ran around the pen looking this way and that. Dr. Kennedy slowly stood up straight and put his hands on his hips. He began to look pretty black. Zemer, I suspected all along that you... Oh, cut it out, Kennedy, Dr. Zemer said. Can't you see we're not fooling? This is not a joke, I tell you. Help us find the thing before he gets away. We just can't lose him. It would be terrible. It would be a terrible loss to science. I looked across the chicken coop, and just at that moment, I have to notice a chicken standing by the fence. 
She was tilting her head to one side the way hens do when they see something new. And then while I was watching, she slipped through the fence and started pecking at some grass outside. I went over and looked at the fence. There was a place where two sections met that had been pushed apart and it was left a space and big enough for a chicken to get through. I showed it to Dr. Zemer. Hmm, I see, he said. He probably crawled under his own pen, pushed right around through here. He wanted some grass, no doubt. We'll have to hunt for him in that long grass. You run into the house and get your sister to help us, and I'll start looking right away. I dashed into the house. Cynthia was doing the breakfast dishes, and Mom was rolling out pie crust. Why, Nate, where have you been? Mom wanted to know. Dr. Kennedy's come, I said, and we went out to show him the dinosaur and he was gone he must have slipped through the fence and we're looking for him in the deep grass we've got to find him before he gets away looking for dr kennedy mom said kind of astonished why he only just got here didn't he no 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 not dr kennedy for uncle beasley and it would be terrible if we couldn't find him pop came in from the other room come on cynthia he said let's go help we all streamed out of the house and when I looked back, there was mom coming too. She had the long handled mop. We all went back and forth through the grass patch, but no Uncle Beasley. Then we went to the goat's pasture and looked around there. The grass was pretty short in there, but we didn't see a sign of Uncle Beasley anywhere. I was poking along the fence and back in Mr. Parsons, Mrs. Parsons' house where she had some flower beds. Good morning, Nate, Mrs. Parsons said. What are you folks looking for out there anyway? And you've got company too. I never saw such carrying ons. The goats get out. She was cutting some flowers with a big pair of scissors. No, ma'am, I said. It isn't the goat. She's right over there in the lot. Well, then what is it? You don't have to be so mysterious about it, do you? Well, the fact is we've lost a little or little animal. What kind of animal? My gracious, you're being awfully close about it. Is it a cat? No, ma'am, I said. It's not a cat. It's a small dinosaur. Mrs. Parsons straightened up and gave me a funny look, and then she started to smile. My land, Nate, how you talk. I didn't know you mean a toy animal. I thought you were looking for a live one. Why, hear the boy talk. I'm looking for a small dinosaur, he says. While she was talking, I saw something move in, um, among the gladioli. I kept my eye on it. Pretty soon, a head stuck out. It was Uncle Beasley. All right and he was chewing happily on the gladiola stalk as if it was the best thing he'd ever tasted. Mrs. Parsons had noticed any, hadn't noticed anything yet, and she was still going on talking. Ha ha, Mrs. Parsons said, laughed. When you said you were looking for a small dinosaur, you gave me quite a turn for a moment, because I thought you meant, oh mercy, what's that? I slipped over the fence in a flash and picked up Uncle Beasley. He was still chewing on the flower stalk, just as if nothing had happened at all. Mrs. Parsons half backed off away and pointed her finger at Uncle Beasley. Take it away. Take it away that in this minute. He's eating my gladioli. I guess everyone heard all the racket. They came running from across the field and Dr. Zemer was all, sm all smiles. He was so glad we found the dinosaur again. And Pop was apologizing to Mrs. Parsons. She had taken one of the gladiolis and that was a yellow one that she didn't really care for anyway. She'd always been interested in dinosaurs, she said. She used to read about them when she was a girl, but she hadn't supposed they ever came that small. That's a real little one you've got there, she said. Kind of cute, isn't it? But she didn't offer to come any nearer, I noticed. Well, all this while, Dr. Kennedy had just been standing there with his mouth open, staring at Uncle Beasley. Then he opened and shut his mouth a few times, but couldn't seem to say anything. Finally, he grabbed Dr. Zemer by the arm, pointed at the dinosaur, and said in a kind of strangling voice, Great Scott, Zemer! You were right, it is. He turned away as wide as a sheet and grabbed hold of the fence to steady himself. Well, they finally got Mrs. Parsons quieted down, and Dr. Zemer introduced Dr. Kennedy to everything, everybody, and Pop introduced Dr. Zemer to Mrs. Parsons, and after everything was all straightened out, we took Uncle, Uncle Beasley back to his pen. We drove in some stakes to hold the wire down tight so he wouldn't get out again. Mom went in to get some breakfast for Dr. Kennedy, and Dr. Zemer began telling Dr. Kennedy all about the egg and how large it was. Nate, he said all at once, I think your dinosaur has grown. Surely he wasn't that big yesterday, was he? He got the scales and his tape measure. I put Uncle Beasley on the scales, but he didn't seem to fit on them as well as before. Seven pounds! Well, that's more than twice what he weighed yesterday. 
He's doubled his weight in 24 hours. Think of that, Kennedy. I am thinking of it. I wish I could say the same for myself. I'm just starved. Do you suppose breakfast is ready? Why, well, I'd forgotten all about that. Nate, why don't you take Kennedy in to breakfast and see that he doesn't eat too many biscuits, even if you have to take a few yourself. I'll just finish these measurements while you're eating. That sounded like a good idea to me. It was almost 10 o'clock in the morning now, and I hadn't eaten a thing since breakfast. All right, we'll start chapter nine next time. Bye.